once won a medal for jumping into a sea of fire to rescue someone. It's only a bit of wreckage and not a man, but that wasn't Harry's fault. It's a slight error in judgment. Wah wah. Um, it's just one of the several we'll be strange the movie. I'll tell you that. Much. Yeah. Wow. Uh, Truman <laughs> Pulitzer Prize winning Truman Capote. Um, we will get into that mess um, in a little bit. But first, we are going to talk more about uh, absurdist action and its origins pre nineteen seventy. Welcome to Film Trace. Take it away, Dan. Yes, Film Trace, the podcast where we trace the life of a film from production. Wait, no, from conception to production, <laughs> all the way to release to reception. It's the last episode of the absurdist action uh, cycle that we're doing. And, and it's, it's actually, it's pretty appropriate that you forgot the word conception, because both these movies might have lacked that. Oh, 100%. Uh, yeah. But that's part of the appeal. Yes. Arguably. Uh, absolutely. <laughs> I mean, there's something uh, kind of magical about making something in the moment, right? It's the creative spirit. Exactly. Um What's the first movie we have here? I had never heard of either of these films, by the way. That's amazing. Uh, I hadn't. Uh, yes, uh, the the our chaser film today, which you heard the clip from, the fifty three Bogart movie, Beat the Devil, um, written by Truman Capote and directed by John Huston, also with Peter Lorre. So it's like a huge cast and crew, and yet uh, it's very very much not known, uh, at least to the average, uh, cinema buff. Um, but, uh, that was also a discovery of mine through research. Uh, hadn't heard of it. Hadn't seen it. Branded to kill. However, our main feature, which we'll get into now is a Japanese Yakuza movie. And there was a brief period. Um, I think right after college, um, I had to come across some, uh, interview with Quentin Tarantino as I was wont to do at age 21. <laughs> oh, this is a great origin story for this. I love it. Yes. And uh, he, you know, he does what he usually does in interviews, which is like rattles off tons of obscure uh, trash movies, right? From yeah. various uh, locales around the world. And um, for whatever reason, like I didn't, it's not like I ticked off the list, but uh, um, for whatever reason, when he was talking about uh, this uh, filmmaker Suzuki Seijun and um, specifically this film branded to kill um, I sought it out it was I I don't remember exactly how I came across the DVD um, but it might have been a public library loan I don't know uh, I dove into it because I was I was like getting really into like Kurosawa at this time and just yeah. Japanese cinema in general um, I never got too deep into it, but this movie uh, stayed with me out of a lot of the films I watched from um, that kind of hazy post-college period. And uh, so when we were talking about absurdist action, it was at the top of my mind as like something was like, oh my gosh, this movie's ridiculous. And yeah. it was also around the time that I was like getting interested in David Lynch and like surrealism in cinema um but it's yeah it's a it's a batshit film so i'm very curious how uh you how, how cold did you go into clicking play on this dan I or did you do any research absolutely first? nothing about it <laughs> amazing like literally nothing and i would say my background on japanese film is slight uh, and that's being generous <laughs> um yeah man like i started to watch this thing and i was like okay i kind of get it um i guess that's not true i love straight dog it's one of my favorite movies um so it's not like totally post um, war Japanese uh, film is not something that I'm totally foreign to. But as I was watching this uh, and the layers of absurdity kind of wash over and over and it gets more and more formalist and surreal, mm -hmm. um, I was completely drawn in. I mean, this <laughs> <Yes>! is like, <laughs> I, you know. I we watch a lot of movies. Like I watch a lot. Of, we watch the movies for this podcast. I watch a lot of movies on the side. It is very, very rare that I come across something that feels one totally unique and kind of its own thing, and also amazing at the same time. And this is just one of those movies where it's like, wow, this is magic. Um, and what's so bizarre about that? Uh, and I came across this sort of realization doing like a lot of the watching a lot of noirs is the uh, the root and source of this film is so bizarre. Uh, it just seems like, how could this surrealist hitman 
I mean, probably high point of late 60s Japanese filmmaking. How does this come from this system that is so uniform and rote and capitalist? Because this is essentially a B-movie through and through. B-movie being the movie that plays the second part of a double header. Mm -hmm. This is from a company that put out a movie, two movies, every single weekend. Right? So they did 104 movies every single year. Insane. This thing was shot in, what, 25 days. It was edited in a single day. Edited the day before it was released. <laughs> like, I, just looking at that and seeing, if you didn't realize any of that and you watch this on screen, you'd be like, oh, this is like, you know, some guy's like fever dream. You know, Suzuki took yeah. a lot of like mushrooms or something and right. worked on this for like years. An auteurist labor of love kind of thing. Exactly. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And um, that's the one thing I can't get out of my head about this film um, is that it's just this weird juxtaposition of almost like pure free uh, creative expression, but it comes from a hyper industrial sort of studio um and not only that but from that world as well the way that they cast it the way everything is shot it's all about speed and efficiency and getting a picture done in, in a month to show it in a month how do you know it's like how do you connect those two together um i don't know has you uh, so you it's been a while since you've seen this yes and how, I had, how, did, how has the experience been the this new time Oh man, um, I mean, there's like so many cinematic, uh, like okay. So I took some film classes in college, and I got kind of like the, you know the the brief overview of a lot of the you know postmodernist, uh, um, uh, it, like the 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 metaphorical language behind film analysis, and you know I kind of uh, used that. A lot, I think, and I was I was trying to think like, did I see this movie or Eraserhead first? I don't know, but it but then like I don't know, four or five years later, I'm realizing I saw another Japanese film that we discussed on the podcast for the self aware horror theme, which is House or Houseu, um, and there was definitely like I don't know, like I I remember seeing and like certain images staying with me, but never really like feeling like it was something big. You know, like it was, yeah. and I think that's, you know, part of like the bias of like seeing Tar Tarantino mention in an interview is just like, oh, this is like one of a million movies he probably watched growing up to um, translate into these big American um, cult movies uh, like Kill Bill and all that. So what I really, what stood, to, stood up to me, stood out to me the most this viewing was like how, even though upon doing research, like you had just mentioned, it's kind of like just a factory film, but Suzuki has like an eye and a flair for um, the ostentatious, for the dramatic, for the absurd. And yet there's like so much to dig into, so much to really like pull apart and consider the meaning of at the same time, like literally every interview, he just says like, I was just trying to make it fun. Yeah, like, fun and entertaining. Exactly. He's, like, he, uh, he's one of, uh, he was lucky enough, or we were lucky enough to have him around for a very long time to get interviews with him, you know, when he was 80, 90 years old. So he had a lot of perspective, you can tell, in these interviews. But yeah, incredibly modest, to say the least. Like, yeah. He never, uh, there was a great one on Criterion where he basically talks about how uh, there's no grammar in, of filmmaking. Mm -hmm. You know, he dives into these sort of theoretical, philosophical uh, concepts around filmmaking. And he, in the way that he answers those questions, is he sort of like, um, no, there's no grammar of filmmaking. Like, there's nothing crazy about it. I was just trying to entertain people. I was trying to titillate people. You know, mm -hmm. that's what, you know, um, what this film house did. It was, these are B movies. But then in answering the questions, he starts talking about how you, how film can break down time. And how you can play with how we perceive reality. So he's kind of answering out of two sides of his mouth. You know what I mean? Like he he wants to say that, oh, this is just kind of schlocky B-movie stuff. But even in sort of describing it, he describes it philosophically. 
he doesn't describe it as sort of like, oh yeah, I just wanted to show like um, naked people having sex <laughs> and like blood. He's like, no, yeah, I wanted. Yeah, I guess it's about a hitman. It's also about like you know the futility of being. <laughs> right. like, you know, like yeah, you're just sort of like, oh, okay, like it, he's being. I think he's being playful, right? Like he's being very mm-hmm. coy. He doesn't really want to own up, and to some degree, he he seems very prideful that people liked the movie, but he says point blank, this is not a philosophical movie, right? Um, which is, you know, how, what do you do with that? Because it right. clearly is, right? It's it, it is completely unlike. 99% of the movies that you would see. Like it and, is poetic at the very least. <laughs> and before we dive even further in, I think any more than any other episode, perhaps we've done so far on this podcast, we've done a lot, lot by now. Um, we've just for, foregone the actual plot of the movie. Doesn't and that, matter. Th- that's fitting. <laughs> but just to recap for anybody that's listening that has not watched Branded to Kill in a while or has not seen it, I urge you to seek it out. Um, Like Dan uh, alluded to, there is a really great Blu-ray available with um, some extras and a nice like, crisp black and white scan. Um, I would uh, argue to say, here's my, I'm I'm curious what your take is of the story, because that's another thing that's so beautiful about this film is because um, it has so many layers to it, just like narratively, um, that you could, you could see it, in my view, as one of three mi- main possible stories. Sure. And it, it's almost like a triptych. It, 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 maybe this is a ridiculous comparison, but it reminded me of Moonlight in that okay. there's a very distinct like first, second, and third of the film. It's not necessarily about like the, the growing up or the aging of a character, but it's like the first third is your like action spy movie. The second third is your like dream logic Lynchian romance thing. And then your final third is like a, uh, like a goofy, like spy versus spy action comedy. And that's really where like the, mo- the majority of the absurdism and the comedy comes in, even though it's very um, uh, elemental throughout those first two as well, just in stranger or le- in, more subtle ways, except for the guy running from the building on a fire. But <laughs> what what was your take of like just the story to begin? I mean, it's because you're a story I'm, guy. You, I mean, like, I am a, I, oh, you're hundred percent right. I am a story guy. I love um, story structure, beats, uh, genre conventions. I think they're often vital to telling even a decent story. Um, here's where I, I make an exception. Okay, because this is a movie, and this tends to happen, I think, often in B movies that are perceived as throwaway, because there is a sense of sort of freedom to be like, well, this is a second run feature. Like, you know, at that point, they just kind of want to see people getting shot and people naked <laughs> and having sex. Like, let's just like do whatever. Um, and that playfulness is obviously here. Um, what makes it so interesting to me is that he also says stuff like, it's not a Yakuza movie. It's not a gangster movie. Well, of course it is. Yeah. Um, and it's, to me, it's just, um, it feels like a movie made by somebody who has made something like this many, many times before. And they kind of reach a breaking point where yeah. they're like, yeah, this is supposed to be a normal sort of gangster movie. The story is very simple. The the gangster wants to be hitman number one. That's it. Yeah. That's really all it's all it's about. He's number three, he wants to move up to number one. And it's kind of, you know, the finale kind of uh you know bleeds into that completely. Um everything else it, it's weird it's really a dream logic movie, and it's either you go with it or you don't. Um and I do think that like this story does not hold together whatsoever. Because it really isn't a story. Um, there's a narr- there's a, an emotional narrative, though. Mm-hmm. Right? So I think on that level, it actually feels pretty tight. Like, But it's more emotional vignettes being braided together. Um, yeah. And that does not lend itself to the plot making sense at all. And it does not make sense. Um, and everybody, you know, and, <laughs> in the studio head saw this, and that's exactly what he said. He's like, well, this doesn't make any sense. I, don't, I can't even comprehend this. And I'm Mm -hmm. sure when the first audiences saw it too, they were sort of like expecting a traditional gangster film. uh, And they got something that was more just poetic. 
Um, so I'd say, yes, you're, uh, I would say that the story, the basic story convention here blows up in the first act and never gets put back together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, and I'm okay with that. Cause in the first part I was like, okay, it's kind of going to be like a, a cool noir hitman movie. And then it just, but they, the realization to me where it hit, and I don't know a lot about the um, production code MPAA stuff uh, in Japan, post world war two, but wow. I mean, the sex scenes here yeah. are intense. And like the moment I started to see the, that, that first with his wife and she's walking around, you know, like full frontal nudity, nudity, and just like completely off the walls sex. You're like, well, this isn't normal. Like this isn't a normal sort of film. It's kind of like doing something completely different. Is this an erotic thriller too? Can we like lump this in with body? Sure. Heat? Yeah, I mean, definitely. Let's do that. <laughs> <laughs> But it's, it's like, it's, I don't know, man, it's all over the place. But in the, it, normally when I say that, it's a bad thing. Right. But like very rare can a movie be all over the place, be a noir, be um, uh, kind of a sex thriller, be sort of a, an absurdist, surrealist nightmare film. Uh, very rarely does that work. And it just, everything clicks here for some reason. Yeah, it's so strange. The one thing that like, like I had kind of mentioned earlier, um, I had remembered it and I like was like, Oh yeah, that'd be a good one to do for the show. But it wasn't like, it's never been like a favorite of mine. And like I said, there was just like snapshots, like the butterfly silhouettes and uh, like him rising on that hot air balloon, like things that stuck with me that clearly made me uh, still recall it and be excited to rewatch it years later. But then just like re like rewatching it, um, now, maybe especially because of the trajectory that we've been working on with absurdist action, that was one of the things that stuck with me the most is that, uh, you know, unlike the thriller genre, which we talked about existential thrillers last cycle, um, there hasn't been a lot of like artfulness to this uh, cycle of films, like That's lots good, of yeah. great movies. Um, I think the closest thing it comes to is like, yeah, there's like maybe tiny pieces in the dialogue of Thunderbolt and Lightfoot and the cinematography. Yeah. Um, but other than that, like the only other connection that really like felt true to me with all the other movies we've done uh, for these six episodes is uh, the Chaser film from the 2000s in Bruges, which uh, ha does a very like kind of playful take on um, the action comedy but also doubles it with this like very philosophical like it's still much more serious even though it's very much a comedy um but other than that like can you think of like yes tarantino clearly there's reason to believe why how this movie influenced his work and maybe in some respects you could argue that uh inglorious bastards is a action comedy Maybe, uh, but other like where where does this place um, in the history of uh, this this world of absurdist action where it's like yeah. we've talked about both like straight action movies that are absurd like Bad, Bo Bad Boys and we've talked about comedy films that have action set pieces like Hot Fuzz. Does it fit anywhere in that spectrum? I mean, in the in the cycle that we did, it it is absolutely its own beast. Mm -hmm. Like it is doing its own thing. But, you know, I was trying to think about this. I was like, okay, like this certainly fits in what we're doing. Um, but it doesn't seem like there's any sort of children of this film. Yeah. Um, at least in kind of what we're talking about. But then you think about something like bad boys and you're sort of like, well, wait a second. Like mm. what is Michael Bay actually doing here? Like he's just turning everything up to eleven, essentially. Now he doesn't really do it with the sex, but he certainly does it with the violence and the comedy. Yeah, and I think that like there is there is some lineage there. Uh, it, it's a little bit loose, but it's essentially the sense that like if you're going to make an exploitation film, you know, turn it all the way up. And Michael Bay essentially made an exploitation film that was palatable for the masses. Yeah, for the masses, right? Yeah, he's he's sort of watered it down and diluted it a bit. Um, but it's still the same concept, you know, kill a lot of people, blow up a lot of things. I mean, one of the things about Brandon to kill is like the first part of it, the Hitman sequence, you know, think about the lighter and the, um, shot through the sink. Yes. Like yes. those are just like really cool, fun things that you would see in a typical, um, 
you know, uh, hyperbolic, uh, bombastic action film. Right. Right. At least a clever one. Um, so there's definitely a lot of um, sort of hand me downs that way. But I, I think the movie as a whole it's just a completely different approach to filmmaking really than anything else that we've seen. I think the closest one, like in Bruce is a good one, but it's still on a different, a different planet. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Like in Thunderbolt and, and Lightfoot as well, you know, obviously uh, a very American sort of um, tale, it, not even close, right. It's completely different um, idea. Uh, and maybe that's just because of the cultural background and sort of how it was made and when it was made. But Brandon Gill is, <laughs> it's like an, on an island and it's a crazy freaking island. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think if anything, it, it's a lot of the flourishes in the movie that you can see in other films, but not the core of it. Uh, the core of it is kind of its own thing. I think. Do you, would you agree with that? Yeah. I think that one of the, I mean, it's interesting because we talk about this as like a you know a factory film. This this studio Nikatsu was n- known for just churning them out, right? <clears throat> and what I think confuses me the most, without having a ton of background knowledge about that decade in uh, mainstream Japanese cinema, or even that specific studio, or honestly, even this is still the only Suzuki movie I've I've seen. Uh, Based on the research, apparently I really need to check out Tokyo Drifter and a couple others. Yeah, on Criterion as well. I watched a little bit of it last night. Nice. Really, very different. Very, very different. (laughs) Okay, okay. But I'm wondering, like, in America, when we talk about a, quote, factory film, or from, like, a studio just churning things out, um, there was, like, a certain sense... um, that thread that we kind of talked about at the top of the show, this episode where it's like, there's a haphazardness to it, right? The bad boy script, you know, languished until like Bay just pushed it through with Bruckheimer's money. Mm -hmm. Um, Midnight run. It was a script laying around until finally Martin breast picked it up and using Robert De Niro's star power made it happen. Um, Bullet train, (laughs) the movie that like kickstarted this all, (laughs) excuse me, which interestingly, you know, riffs on takes a lot of liberties with Japanese culture takes place in Japan. Um, very much felt like that was just a movie that was made because the filmmaker and Brad Pitt were like, this is something we can do during COVID. (laughs) Yeah, true. It's right there. Yeah. So like Suzuki is clearly, you know, game for it. He want, he wanted that (laughs) steady paycheck. And the thing that, cement spread into kills legacy which i don't think we've technically mentioned yet but is very important to its history is this is the movie that got him fired from the studio yeah 100%. not only did the exact say this doesn't make any sense he said this doesn't make any sense and then suzuki didn't get a paycheck that month <laughs> <laughs> um is, is i mean it, it like it broke the system right or it kind of like led to the deconstruction of that that kind of factory filmmaking and something similar i think started happening in American cinema a couple different times throughout recent history. Um, but including like when we, uh, look at the 1970s, which is just a few years after this. And we see how, you know, renegade auteurs take the system and light it on fire. And that's where some of our best movies in history come from. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, uh, that's kind of like in a weird way, Suzuki had been, this was his 40th film, I think. Something like that. Something crazy. Yeah. Um, he'd just been churning them out left and right. It is kind of, it, he didn't state this as much, but he says something in one of the interviews where it was like, he was talking to his wife. He's like, I actually don't like filmmaking. <laughs> I hate it. I hate the, the intensity of it. He hated the schedules. And I think he said with this movie, he just got to the point where he felt so rebellious and, and fed up with the whole thing that he just sort of, did whatever he wanted to do. Um, and, and the key here too is like in that system in Japan, I think this is very similar, probably more in the forties and fifties or thirties, forties, fifties, United States is that in a studio system, you don't have much control over things. Right. And Suzuki didn't have control over the lead. Right. Um, Joe Shishido was picked for this movie. It was a movie mm-hmm. for him. Now the rest of the cast, he got to choose. We didn't get to pick the lead. And the script I find incredibly interesting 
where, you know, they didn't give him a script, which was the norm. Normally yeah. they would give uh, the script to the director. We just, you got to film this. And he says early in his career, he was getting all these scripts. So he never felt like he could be artistic with them. Yeah. Because it was like, yeah, I can't do it. But this one, they basically asked him for a script. But I think they, uh, he turned to dinner or something like that. And they're like, well, this is inappropriate. <laughs> <laughs> and then, but then he went back and then he wrote it with a group of eight guys. And so this is right. a collective script um, from a group of eight, you know, directors and whoever in this group. And I think they wrote it over like drinks and stuff, essentially, is what they said. <laughs> so they're at the bar writing this movie. And that makes a lot more sense when you watch it. Right. Um, it yeah, it's it is an act of, of rebellion, without a doubt. Um, and it's one where it kind of cost him his career because not only was he fired from the studio, he was also banned for 10 years essentially Yeah, because he sued the studio for damages and he won. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so no other yeah. studio wanted to touch him. It was only after he started to get into commercials again. Uh, I think he won an award for a commercial and that got him back on the map again. He started to make films. Uh, once more but yeah i mean you're really it's kind of just like a bucket let's just go for it moment mm -hmm. and um yeah it, it actually you know it reminds me a little bit of and i always bring this back but like what came out a year later in the united states is night of living dead yeah which yeah. was a film that again b movie was supposed to play afternoon theaters mm -hmm. and drive-ins and it's like a molotov cocktail of a film um, and this feels similar, you know, obviously from a very different background and very different message, but a similar sort of, um, I don't know, just desire to break things, uh, a desire to break down a system that he was frustrated by and hated. Um, and I don't know, I, you look at his other movies, I, I got to watch more of his stuff to feel like, because there's other people that say this is a, you know, this isn't that different of a Suzuki movie. It's just yeah. kind of like blended in the right way. So it's the right proportion of different elements. Um, but to me, yeah, it's sort of like, wh what is interesting too, is that like in the United States, we had a system like that going, I don't know, I guess it died in the sixties. Maybe a similar timeline. By the time you get to like the seventies and back to, uh, Chimino, who's famous for destroying, for kind of starting it on one level and yeah. then destroying <laughs> it with heaven's gate. What was that set? What is heaven's gate? 80, 79, 80. Yeah. Okay. In 1980, which you know, famously, I think what took United Artists out of business. Um, it is interesting that that uh, I can't get away from this. How this system has never propped up again. Mm -hmm. Why is it that you know? I think about this. This is something. That's, I don't know how this is related, but I'm going to say it anyways. Under the constraints that Suzuki was in the budget was $1.3 million in today's money for this movie. 1.3 million. Amazing. And in the extreme, um, sort of restrictions in terms of time and all this sort of stuff, I'll say it again. It was edited in a single yeah. freaking day and then released the next day. Why is it that this movie is so much better than a movie that let's say like avatar, <laughs> which is now hear me out here part of a system that allows directors to do whatever they want for the most part. Now he's James Cameron was director, producer, whatever, right. Given hundreds upon hundreds of millions of dollars. I think what avatar probably costs 200 times what this movie costs to make. Mm -hmm. And the final product is 100% the image and vision of the creator. And it's complete and absolute trash. <laughs> Compared to something like this, where even Suzuki's like, yeah, I don't know. Like the butterflies. Yeah. One of the guys put in the script. So I just did it. Right? Like what? <laughs> I just can't reconcile those two because we're obsessed. I think we're often obsessed with creative freedom and the control yeah. of the director. But here you have freedom. So compressed. It's so restrained. And yet it still finds a way out. You know what I mean? Right. And we also, to go back to your point about the, you know, collective, and uh, yeah, the word collective is very different than like, you know, rewrites a plenty. But yeah. like when we see a movie in America and we see, you know, seven or eight names in the written by credits, it's kind of a signal like this is going to be trash. This is going to be something that they just like tried over and over again to make work. And it it probably won't. 
Um, and it rarely does. And yet there's this kind of, I mean, th- that almost speaks to maybe a cultural difference, right? Where it's like, they didn't necessarily like, ha- it, 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 there was no languishing here. I mean, that's part of the yeah. compression, right? Is like literal, like so little time to second guess themselves. And, you know, I don't know if James Cameron's ever second guessed himself in his life, but he very much like has the time, like even now, you know, with the, <laughs> it turning into a theme park and now a, a long gestating sequel and all this. And it'll, I'm, I'm very curious to see how that lands uh, eventually at the end of this year compared to like, you know, the, the one, two punch. It, I'm just looking at this and his second highest rated movie is that Tokyo drifter title. And yeah. that was, li- that was less than a year prior. Yeah. Oh yeah. So like, I, it's, it's confusing to me because, uh, kind of like when we were discussing drunken master two and I, I mentioned how like, it felt like, uh, opening a window to this entire world I didn't know existed. Yeah. Um, and that I was just like trying to navigate and understand the nuts and bolts of much, not even like getting to the point of trying to understand the details. There's something similar here too. And I think that it kind of got lost in my own memory hole a little bit because it uh, there i don't know is there hmm, i i'm, I'm kind of taking off off topic but and i did oh, I, go for it. I, love I hesitate it. Go. to use the word but there's almost like a i don't know i have like a different like globalist perspective now that i like didn't that didn't even register for me growing up it seemed like these like obscure titles and there's also like these are way more accessible than they ever were, right? Um, though there's obviously the counter argument to be made that streaming is, you know, uh, constraining the availability of a lot of titles. Um, but I, I, it's just it's bizarre because if you compare it to that American system, I don't feel like I even have like one twentieth of an understanding of what that entire world is yet. And so, and that's part of, that's part of the appeal too, to like see this world unfold in a rewatch, like not even a first watch, a rewatch and to, to be just astounded by, um, how a film can do things that you didn't think film could do. Like oh, I was absolutely. Yeah. like, yeah. <laughs> I thought that, you know, compared to, like I said before, like I have, uh, this movie and Eraser had kind of linked in my mind, um, Eraserhead, as strange and messed up as it was to see for the first time, like probably my first like abstract film I saw, American one anyways, and I just like, oh, okay, that makes sense because this guy's weird. But like there's so much more going on here than just this guy's weird, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I mean like, it, and that's where we kind of get into choppy water because you start talking about more experimental filmmakers and... I mean, what's a good example of uh, something like I think some pops in my is like Dogville, right? Sure. Like where it's like okay, <laughs> like this is interesting and cool. I love that movie. It was fascinating and different, but it's what hundred percent not a mainstream movie, mm-hmm, and mm-hmm. definitely trying to push what is filmmaking and what it can be uh, in its own direction, which is awesome. What I find sort of super appealing about Branded to Kill is that the experimentation experimentation for experimentation's sake is always something that's probably not going to get a pass for most people. Mm. Now, if you're in filmmaking and you're in that art form, you're probably going to be much more willing to do that. I'm like that with music. I would say I'm most knowledgeable at music. And so when I have a, there's a band like liars who does a whole, you know, album about whatever, which is the witch trials. And it's atonal and it's messy <laughs> and there's no harmonies or melodies. I'm like, oh, this is cool. I respect that, right? Um, there's certainly a place for that in film. And I don't have enough of a background to really pick out those artists. I don't. But this feels so different than even that. Yeah. Where it is experimental, but because of the um, sort of chains around it, it's like constantly fighting with telling a normal genre story the entire right. time it's fighting uh and it's using these experimental flourishes to sort of attack them in a way and you can see this war playing out on screen between like what is respectable and what 
is sensical versus sort of something that's emotional and insane almost. Yeah. And it's a sort of like, I don't get that in a normal experimental film that's kind of just wanting to push boundaries. This is pushing specific boundaries in a specific way. Um, and I think that's what, that's kind of what makes it special to me. Um, I don't know. I, does that sort of, does that make sense? It's like, um, you know, I could make an album of music that is just me like, uh, you know, clapping and whistling and like that's experimental. <laughs> right. And it's like, well, you know, I'm pushing the boundaries of what a song is or like shoegaze <laughs> music would be like, we're trying to destroy the pop song, stuff like that. Right. But maybe it's like my bloody Valentine where it's like, yeah, you're full of shit, but you're also doing it at the same mm-hmm. time. You know yeah. what I mean? Like you're actually following through with your desire to dissect and deconstruct something that, we commonly share. And in this case, it's just like a B mo- uh, a hitman B movie. Right. But he like, I don't know. There's something about, he like takes a scalpel to it and like cuts it in exactly the right ways so that like something underneath it comes out. And what, what underneath it comes out is kind of terrifying. Yeah. Uh, it does. This movie feels like a nightmare. Um, and yeah, I don't know. I mean, I'm sort of rambling a bit, obviously, but like, it, I think I really latch on to what you said about I didn't realize movies or film could do this. Right. Right. And I'm someone who is hyper skeptical of movies that don't make sense yeah. and don't have a basic story. And this one falls under those categories, but for whatever reason, uh, because of the, I don't know, I'm going to say it, the humanity infused with it in it, it works. <laughs> it just like sings to me for some reason. Yeah. You know, there's a there's a few different examples in particular that kind of speak to what you're saying, where it's like, uh, I mean, that when it comes down to it, like all the way from this film all the way to Bullet Train, you ultimately have films that are trying to take like either criminals uh, that are doing bad things or law enforcers that mm-hmm. don't play by the rules and humanize them right Absolutely, yeah and um he had a uh interesting um interview in 2001 about this film with uh midnight eye which is a japanese cinema um publication um he wrote he said in the interview um that it wasn't the genres so though it's not noir it's not spy movies not yakuza like you were mentioning earlier um but the character uh of the killer They wander between life and death. As a character, they are more interesting than normal people. They live very near death, so we can describe how they die, where they die, and when they die. You have a wider range of possibilities than you would otherwise if you were depicting a normal person. So there's kind of this meta piece going on where it's not just like the artist being compressed by those restrictions and thereby like trying to like, you know, what's the phrase, like squeeze a diamond out of a whatever. Um, (laughs) I forget. Um, (laughs) But uh, he, we're also seeing that in the film. And I think that's, that's kind of where I see that linked in Bruges as well, where like the, you know, part of the main absurdity of that film is you've got a suicidal killer. um, And then here you've got uh, somebody that is able to like break apart that philosophy and as you mentioned, at at its base, it's the, you know, number three trying to become number one, which is almost like ironic. Like you want you want there to be a bigger target on your back. Like there's literally one the the femme fatale character, which is also a kind of a reversal of the femme fatale. Um, she says, My dream is to die. Yeah. So there's like this, I mean, that's one of the things that I think makes this film so special and uh, movies like it even though there are few and far between is they're able to take this very kind of like mass market genre and not care at all about the limitations of that genre and just have to, you know, go to that core of like who this person is, why we should care about them, why we want to follow their journey. um, Even though it's almost certainly going to end poorly. And, you know, he, he also mentioned, uh, um, uh, in a book, uh, in 2003, uh, called the Yakuza book about Yakuza cinema in Japan, um, that, uh, 
one of the restrictions, one of the rules that he had to follow, according to Katsu, the studio, was that he couldn't kill the protagonist at the end, yeah. which he almost found like humorous. Like, how, how how do you make a movie about a killer and they don't themselves get killed? Um, but he, at the very least, like it seems like that's pretty revolutionary for the time. He's able to leave that open ended. Yes, the amb- um, ambiguity. Yeah, and so there's like this literary quality to it and this philosophical quality to it, and yet it is just like literally every frame is fun to to look at. <laughs> yeah, it's almost like it's like uh, it's like candy. Yeah, you know, visually and, and uh, yeah, it just it's constantly alluring uh, on so many different levels, and it's um, it's funny that we're gonna close with beat the devil. Yeah, <laughs> because it's. Uh, it's so different in so many different ways, but like what's funny about um, Beat the Devil is that it felt like a little bit of a similar sort of production situation where they're mm-hmm. making it up as they go along. Yeah. Right. And I think to different, different results, I would say. Yes. Why, why don't you give me your intro on Beat the Devil? Cause I think this is your selection. Did you know this movie pretty well before or what? No, I had no idea. I was, um, very interest like uh, branded to kill seemed like a no brainer yeah. um, to look at uh, absurdism and action um, before 1970. But yeah. I was really struggling because I wanted to kind of counter it with something American and maybe something even older. This is the oldest we've ever gone um, into um, cinema yeah. history for this show. Um, but I want I, I like a challenge. And um, it just like I had mentioned before, it was amazing that there was this movie um, directed by John Huston, yeah. featuring uh, Bogart and Pilore, so the exact trio from literally well, probably my top five film noirs of all time, Maltese Falcon. Yeah, and yet I'd never heard of it. And add on top of that, written by Truman Capote, uh, you know the the infamous author of Breakfast at Tiffany's and In Cold Blood, yeah. and I was I was all about it. I was like, okay, boom, that's it. Um, the thing that kind of like uh was it not just that like i wanted to see it to see what it was all about but it made sense for this cycle is it was one of the central um uh titles of pop culture that was mentioned in susan sontag's famous essay notes on camp mm-hmm. um which had a resurgence a couple of years ago because i think camp was one it was like the theme of the met gala okay. um, a few years ago um But uh, and then, of course, it just ignited an Internet firestorm with discourse about what is camp or campy. And um, it's it's curious because, like, there is this kind of adventure quality. Houston's also obviously very famous for two other adventure Bogart films, The African Queen and Treasure of the Sierra Madre. Um, And obviously, a lot of these old Hollywood stories have humor to them. But by kind of the story like you were alluding to of this kind of written on the fly barely thought out film combined with like the literary world's hero and the film world's heroes um and it just turned into be like shambles like it was <laughs> it was a flop upon release in yeah. the 50s it wasn't until the 60s when Susan Sontag wrote about it as part of her camp essay that suddenly it was brought back to the forefront and it ended up running for weeks um, in theaters 10 years after its initial release, which is crazy. Um, that so that, is that's so why this is hard to me. Yeah. It's something that, yeah, totally unheard of for, for today's standards. Right. Yeah. So, so walk me through, first of all, I have to note, um, and I'm really mad that I think my, my opinion on the film would have changed drastically if I had known yeah. when you search, uh, it's uh, available for streaming on prime video. Mm-hmm. When you search it up, there's two options, the colorized version and the black and white version. Did you watch the color? I stupidly watched the colorized version. <laughs> Cause it wasn't colorized originally, right? No. It and like, it's yeah. such a bad colorization. I don't even oh, know why it? it exists. <laughs> um, um, yeah. So yeah. I watched the black and white version on prime. Of course it was free. Um, yeah, I mean, Maltese Falcon, oh God, I'm going to sound like... It's not one of your faves, right? It's not one of my favorites. Okay. Um, I would look to something that, like, you think of, like, foundational noir, I was like, detour would be, like, something that, like, oh, that's, like, more, more, like, has bite to it, at least for me. The Maltese Falcon create all these genre conventions, so you can't, like, dismiss it at all. Watching this thing, man, um, (laughs) 
I just, mm, it was like the, like people talking about the camp element of it and all this sort of stuff. I feel like something's been lost in the last 60 years, 70 sure. years in the sense that like, all I could really think about with this movie was that they're going to basically rob people of their resources. <laughs> um, and yep. like, yep. what confused me about that was like, well, that's where the satire is, right? Mm-hmm. Clearly the satire is in these ridiculous rich people who are well off or also at the same time grifters trying to out grift each other, which is funny. Yeah. Um, and they're, none of them are particularly good at it. No, exactly. They're right. bumbling idiots when it comes yeah. to it. Um, and that, like, that, that's playful and fun. And then you ground it in sort of like, oh, yeah, they're going to get uranium right from <laughs> basically people. That, it, it, at least it's not unobtainium. <laughs> <laughs> Call back. Yeah, right. Exactly. Um, I, and it, what, what's interesting to me about it too, is sort of like, so Borgart signs on to this movie, they get all the production money lined up and you know, it's originally a novel and the novel's written by a real left winger. Yeah. Uh, called Claude uh, Cockburn. And it was originally set in a French town. Uh, and it was supposed to be a serious movie about the <laughs> evils of colonial exploitation, which makes way more sense when you think about it. Yeah. But then I guess Capote and Houston were like, oh, let's no, Houston's decided to make it a comedy. And Capote was like, well, I, this is a job. So I'm going to show up and, and write this thing with you. Um, yeah, the whole thing. They also wanted a vacation in Italy, not France. Yeah, what is this couples retreat <laughs> back in 1953? Like, what is it? This? Basically, no. is. <laughs> I mean, that, but that's okay. So, if some of that stuff is true, but I can't dismiss the camp element of it. Yeah. Right. I can't do that. I can't just be like, well, that's not there. It is there. It's just, but what the hell does it add up to? Camp mm-hmm. about what? You know what I mean? Like, it's camp about adventure movies, leading men. Uh, Houston's kind of satire in his own movies to some degree. Um, but then it, it's, that feels so insular in a way. And it's like, is this camp just for like upper middle-class white people? Like, I don't, you know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? Like trying to like latch onto the camp part of this. And I'm just sort of like, yeah, it was written to the last second. It's true. McCapote. He's got a really good sense of humor. That's kind of obtuse or not obtuse, but like slanted, I guess. Yeah. Um, so that's there, but like the movie's a complete mess. That's like such a mess. Absolute mess of a film. There's no good characterization. There's no yeah. good uh, plots that really plot points that really work. It's a playful throwaway movie, and that's totally fine for what it is. But I do. I just. It's so fascinating to me that it's had this second life. Yes. I, what do you understand about the second life? Why do you think that that's happened? What have I missed? You know- I'm looking at Sontag's uh, paragraph about Beat the Devil, and um, the famous quote about it from her is uh, that, um, so she starts by saying, the greatest camp movies ever made come from the effortless, smooth way in which tone is maintained. That's And she uses that to describe movies like All About Eve, Oscar winner, yeah, film is, history. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and then Beat the Devil, she says, uh, they had... It may have its fine moments, but um, it's so hysterical. They want so badly to be campy that they're continually losing the beat. Perhaps, though, it is not so much of a question of the unintended effect versus the conscious intention as of the delicate relation between parody and self-parody. So, I mean, that's a that's a tongue twister, brain twister of a sentence oh. in pure Sontag fashion. Okay. But I very much think that, I mean... We talked about I mean, that's the another connection, perhaps, with uh, Branded to Kill. We talk about it like you know, eight friends at a bar getting drunk and writing this batshit crazy movie. Yeah, and similarly, like, uh, I mean, this is you know, Houston's at the is is a millionaire. Bogart's a millionaire. Capote's a millionaire. Yeah, and they are very much like they think that they're parodying something, but it ends up just reflecting backward on them. Right? Oh, okay. Now, now I'm getting that. <laughs> and so, oh. so I think that, I mean, to, to compare it to what we see happening with this kind of subgenre um, as the years go on, especially in American cinema, 
um, since Beat the Devil is an American film. I think we see that very much so in that kind of spectrum, like I mentioned earlier, between Bad Boys and Hot Fuzz, right? Sure. So, I mean, it, obviously, it's very hard to get in the minds of like a 1950s or 60s audience, whether when it was a flop or when it you know kind of resurrected itself. But that's also like, I mean, B-movies... Um, at least in the traditional sense, are very much synonymous with the 50s, right? Yeah. There was just, like, so much glut of just, like, trash film from both, like, top dog filmmakers to bottom rung um, made. And so you, like, have, you know, it, it, it's it's frustrating, and yet I think there, for some reason, that was part of the appeal, is, like, let's go, let's go see what uh, um, Bogart and Houston... Um, made uh, uh bogart famously uh broke his nose and uh houston fell off a cliff during filming <laughs> alcohol was probably a factor in both yes so it's like i don't know i mean we're talking already we even before we press record don't worry darlin's coming out in a few weeks <laughs> it's all that's a fine. really yeah I mean, it's a really good point it, it's, it's like, pretty timely <laughs> well but it, what's interesting about that too is sort of like it's <laughs> intentional camp versus unintentional camp Mm -hmm. And you have intentional camp? Of course. Without a doubt. Is it intentional here? No. Like, it's uh, like, there's no way it's like, is Capote going in and basically being like, well, I'm going to pick apart um, the common themes of movies and these sort of travel adventure movies over the last five, six years? Probably not. No. He was calling his pet crow on the telephone. On set. <laughs> no, it's, isn't it a raven or is it a crow? A raven? I don't know, man. But <laughs> like, they everybody was just, just yeah. That nobody was well, but, thinking much during this. <laughs> but it's funny because we talk about hot fuzz is like in it very intentionally camp, mm -hmm. and there's like there's a level of sort of sophistication and like hard work that goes into that because you're really picking apart a genre of film and kind of reassembling it in a way that that's hilarious. Now with beat the devil, it's sort of like, Oh, I guess it's camp because it's such a disaster. Yeah. Like, and if that's the case, then like it's more akin to the room right. or in my yeah. world, Spanglish, which is <laughs> one of my favorite movie. Speaking of going on a vacation to film a movie. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's yeah. I, I, that, that makes a little bit more sense then. Right. Like it, to me, at least it's like, Oh, I understand what you're saying. It's basically, it's a total shit show of a movie. All these famous people are involved. It's yeah. Okay. Don't worry, darling. Then is a really kind of, uh, kind of touch tone movie yeah. or uh, connection then. Um, but how do we, what's interesting about this is like, how do we contextualize this within absurdist action? Like to me, this is sort of a precursor to um, when did oceans 11 come out? Was it before this? No, it couldn't. Have uh, been. No, no, couldn't it was. Been. Yeah. Few, next. Well, I mean, it might've come out before it's resurgence. Um, the original one, 19, I don't know. 1960. Um, yeah. Okay. So yeah, a little bit later, but yeah, it's like, uh, it's one of those kind of, um, playful heist movies and hot yeah. rock, right. right? Feels a lot like the hot rock, like in terms of just like bumbling around trying yeah. to do this thing and it's not going to work out. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, I gotta say though. Like I, I'm glad that we paired this with Brandy to Kill because it just makes Brandy to Kill feel much, feel so much more amazing. Right. Um, God, did the style of filmmaking back then feel so stuffy mm -hmm. and so ah, God, it just feels like it's got dust all over it. You know, it's the reason why. Like I think, and this is like uh, like a lot of people when they're younger, you see something in black and white, and you're like whatever man like, <laughs> i'm gonna go watch independence day for the fifth time that was me when i was like 14 years old right um but then you go back and watch this stuff and it's like uh i you know i can see why if you saw if you, uh, the ra random 16 year old would see this what would they think they i mean they wouldn't leap. they wouldn't last yeah exactly they would be on their phone the entire time so it's like <laughs> not to attack it but it's sort of like god did movie making change in the 60s the mm -hmm. 70s because it, it became almost a completely different art form right like, this is more like a play like a teleplay yeah and i mean that's not to say that like i mean there's plenty of great films from the 50s but i Amazing think especially I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah um you have uh especially like this advent of set piece filmmaking and i yeah. mean 
I, I, yeah, I slagged on the movie a lot, just like you, but the one piece of it that I was just like always interested in seeing where it was go next is because, you know, it's from locale to locale. And, you know, I got frustrated because it was still like medium shot locale, medium shot locale, but like <laughs> it, it has this sense of like it, those inklings anyways, of like films starting to get bigger than just people in a room. Right. Um, you have uh, uh, these um, kind of big uh, scenes that yes, kind of fall short, but there was there it's, it, it very much feels like a precursor to, you know, trying to bridge that kind of expansiveness of the old Western with like the yep. more modern, like commentary trappings of a comedy or uh, a, a spy movie or a noir. Right. And you really feel like, I mean, um, Houston clearly made his bones with, I think, especially treasure of the Sierra Madre, because he was able to, to really find that bridge. And that's, you know, just a couple of years prior to this. And you have uh, a, a genre that really blossoms. And I think that's part of the point is like, it, it really doesn't get a chance to blossom here in America until much later, but in Japan, not only with the sixties and Suzuki, um, but also obviously Kurosawa. I mean, going back to the, the fifties and forties yeah. with, with uh, stray dog and yeah. Ikiru. And um, you have a real sense of uh, that kind of film being a lot more commonly cited as an influence on modern day filmmakers than even like the big names like Houston or uh, uh, Mankiewicz or anything like that. Mank, right? Mank. <laughs> yeah. What is, what do you think that kicks off? Like when we're looking at absurdist action, is it, you know, we looked at Thunderbolt and Lightfoot in 1974. We looked at Hot Rock in 1972, but those don't even seem like really precursors. No. Just sort of like what, and, and I, let's just to define it. The the probably high point of this absurdist action, at least how we're describing, looking at it, is probably the nineteen eighties in U.S. film. Mm -hmm. um, U.S. film. I mean, we, there we, there should be mentioned like British film, and that was part of uh, what Suzuki was trying to do. Yeah. Um, also, was like he he kept getting goaded by the studio to come up with the Japanese James Bond, right? So like, um, both all the early Bond films. Uh, Goldfinger and Dr. No, and also other movies of its ilk in the early 60s, like Ice Station Zebra. Um, you have that. But yeah, I mean, America, it really wasn't until like the late 70s, early 80s, right? Yeah. And then you get, you know, 48 Hours, you get Lethal Weapons, you get Beverly Hills Cop, and it becomes a whole thing in, in U.S. filmmaking. Um, but yeah, it wasn't until till much later that we were ready for um I, I mean it has to do something with reagan i don't know <laughs> like the reagan era like some sort of repression conservative repression happening and so we want to see like people get blown up and naked chicks every and then every movie like there has to be something there um like usually when art sort of goes out uh kind of goes the exploitation route uh and it becomes mainstream there's always some repression going on i think on a societal level so i, I don't know though um, if that's exactly why it was happening in the United States. But I think, yeah, it is fascinating to sort of think about, oh, somebody was doing this 20 years before and doing it much, much better, let's be honest, mm -hmm, uh, in mm -hmm. a completely different uh, country, completely different film system. Um, and you know, that's why I love doing these sort of cycles is because, yeah, you can really draw the parallels, but in, a, in another sense, just find the uniqueness that is out there. And I do think, to me, Branded to Kill is a great sort of way to open up, uh, it's opening up my eyes to that era of Japanese filmmaking, which I've never explored before. Yeah. Uh, and now it's like, I'm obsessed. Like, I have to watch Tokyo Drifter and, and see the whole thing now. And I have to watch his other films and look at, you know, Japanese New Wave uh, and just kind of figure it out. Um, I don't know. I mean, how do you feel about this absurdist action cycle? Like, any... Any holistic overall thoughts? You know, I feel like self-aware horror was, was, I think, inarguably the most cohesive of the three cycles we've done so far. It was easy for us. Yeah, it was fish in a barrel. Uh, existential thriller, um, 
still felt like I, I, I know I was kind of nervous about going into it because it's like, yeah. how how do you how do you uh, um, define? It felt nebulous. Yes. Um, but this one is like I really thought that this was going to be more like fish in a barrel as well, but oh, it yeah. became very difficult to kind of. It, this is this is slippery. It's crazy how how recent the modern action movie is and how much it's changed and how varied the influences around the world. Uh, it's just like, it's, it's incredible that we go from beat the devil to bullet train and there's still like links between them. And yet they're, they don't feel like (laughs) comparable at all. Um, No, they don't even feel like they're the same art form. Yeah. It's absurd. Yeah, it is totally absurd. I would say this too, like, I, I think thinking about this cycle too, it's sort of like, it was the most difficult, but it's also the most rewarding. Sure. Because there's a level of, like, you have to dive a little bit deeper on each one of these films, where it was like, I thought this was going to be, yeah, like, softballs. It's going to be T-ball. Oh, this would be easy. We'll talk about 40 Hours, Bad Boys, Hot Fuzz, whatever. But as we got deeper into the 70s and uh, and 60s and 50s now... Yeah, it's like um, you have to be a little bit more creative in how you're exploring these movies. Mm -hmm. And I think when you do that, you get something a little bit more out of them. Uh, And you get something a little bit more out of the connections. I mean, this is the only cycle, I think, where I found two movies that are probably going to end up being my top 50, which is Thunderbolt and Lightfoot and Brandon Hill. Oh, wow, nice. Right, like they're that interesting to me and that rich to me and i watch movies constantly um but it's sort of it, let's be honest it's the exploration that adds layers to it yes. um and i think that's why we do this and that's why we we love doing it um and that's why i think this cycle is a lot of fun do we want to tease the next cycle do we yeah, have an official it, title man. no you die you go for it uh, <laughs> technically it was your idea uh, yeah yeah i guess um but i think you you uh kind of nailed the uh hammered the nail in all the way because uh this film got its uh huge standing ovation at venice when it premiered um the new uh i don't know how to pronounce his last name luca luca g yeah sure um, <laughs> the guy who made uh, call me by your name uh, his new film bones and all uh which is a cannibal romance so we're gonna look at risque romances so oh, controversial Fantastic. romance films. Do you have poison ivy on here? I see it. Tentatively. <laughs> Tentatively. Oh, <laughs> talk about choppy waters. Wow. Yeah, it we're it's going to be choppy as hell and it's gonna be uh, fun. I'm excited. Wow. We'll 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 be doing that uh come November. Yeah, so November. we're going to take a quick hiatus. Uh definitely recommend going back. We had some great guests this yes. cycle. <laughs> Um, Max, uh, Coville, Ron Tomatoes proved critic, uh, talked with hot, talked with us about hot fuzz and in Bruges, Harry from try love talked with us about bad boys and drunken master Two. our good friend Drax talked with us about the eighties, 48 hours of midnight run. And Daniel from the podcast, you talking to me, uh, discussed Thunderbolt and Lightfoot and the hot rock with us. Definitely dig back to that. And also the previous cycles. Thank you for listening. We can't wait to see you again for our next group of episodes. This has been Film Traits.